Hello everyone, it's Smite Punch Chess here once again, and we've got another Rashid Nezmetnov game against Mikhail Tal here. And this game was played in the USSR Championships in Moscow, 1957. Now in total, these two players played four games against one another, in which Nezmetnov was actually white in all four games. I've covered the first one in a previous video, and now I'll cover this one that was played in 1957. But I'm sure they played many unofficial games as well, because Nezmetnov actually coached Tal which would make a lot of sense because they're absolutely both amazing calculators and offensive players. So without further ado, let's kick off this game. So Nesmetnov is white, Tal is black. The game starts with 1e4, Tal played the French with e6, white played d4, there was d5, knight c3. So into a French winnower, and now Tal played the move bishop to b4, pins the knight on c3, and e5 was played by white, and now c5. And this is a typical opening, and usually here actually white plays the move a3 to attack and hit the bishop. Uh, black's got two options, they can either play bishop takes c3, and then white usually takes, and then there's knight to e7, queen g4, I'm sure you've seen this multiple times. And after a3, black could also play the move a5, and white can respond with b4. After c takes d4, there's queen g4, and we get to quite an interesting game for both sides in this position. However, after c5, Nesmetnov now played a bishop d2 move. Apparently this is popular in the 1930s. The point is if uh, c takes d4, white can play knight to b5, attacking the bishop and also preparing to play knight to d6 with check. A very nice position for white to be in. However, apparently Botvinnik recommended this move, knight to e7. This is what Tau played. The point is after knight to e7, if white plays knight b5 now to go into d6, black can play bishop takes d2 with check. If queen takes d2, black can just castle, and there's no more threat on d6 because there's no check. And this is the way black played it. So, after knight to e7, Nesmetnov played a3, attacking the bishop. Tau took the knight on c3, and then the bishop takes on c3, and here black's actually got a multitude of moves that they can play. c takes d4 is one option here, and after queen takes d4, black can continue with knight c6. There's queen g4 and knight to f5, knight to f3 and queen to b6, bishop to d3 and h5. Now Nesmetnov actually mentions this variation in his book. Previously he played queen f4 in one of his games and he said that led to nothing. So he recommended going queen g5 here. After knight c7 played bishop to b4. And white actually exerts a lot of pressure over black's position. And white is definitely better in this game. So in this position Tal could have also played knight to c6. Again, white can play knight to f3, and if takes, bishop takes d4, and this is actually a dead equal game. So in this position, Tal could have gone in for different moves, but he actually played the move b6 instead, reinforcing his c5 pawn. Nesmetnov played b4, again attacking c5. Queen c7 was played, which is uh, eyeing up this bishop on c3, with maybe a discovered attack at some point. White played knight to f3. Knight d7 was played by Tal, and then bishop to e2 from Nezmetinov. And now knight c6, and both sides castled. Actually, instead of castling, black could have played c takes d4. Uh, but after knight takes d4, knight takes e5. It makes sense why Tal didn't go in for this, because then now white has the amazing move knight to b5, attacking the queen on c7, and protecting the bishop on c3. If queen b8, white can play it f4, hitting the knight, after knight g6, play f5. Again, opening up an attack for white, so all of a sudden this pawn's attacking the knight, this rook's opened up, and this bishop's opened up as well, some very nice lines for white to attack. So white's given up one of the pawns in the centre, but now has an amazing attack to use against black. So for this reason, Tau didn't take on d4, he castled, king safety, and then Nesmetnov took on c5 with the b-pawn, there was b takes c5, and then white took on c5 once again. If knight takes c5, white should play bishop to d3, and has some very nice bishops eyeing up the king side. If knight to e4, Nesmetnov actually was going to go queen to e1, and if bishop to b7, play bishop to b2. And he says that it was an equal game in this variation, which I tend to agree with. And actually the computer gives this as dead equal as well. But... Tal wanted more out of this position. He now played the move knight takes e5. And Nesmetnov actually said in his book this was too much for black. He probably shouldn't have gone in for this. It feels like Tal was too ambitious, which is a typical trait of his play, actually. 
you've got to be ambitious if you want to uh, win the games and sacrifice material. But Nesmetnov calmly played knight takes e5, Tau retook, knight takes e5, and now queen to d4. Hitting this knight on e5 with the bishop and the queen, and if this knight moves, then the queen would just go queen g7 with a checkmate. Tau played f6 to support his knights, and Nesmetnov played f4, attacking the knight. Nesmetnov said that if knight d7, he would have gone f5 and really undermined this e6 pawn and also his d5 pawn. So for this reason, Tau played the move knight c6, attacking the queen. The queen retreated back to e3, and black went rook to d8. Rook a d1 to get their rook into the game as well, stopping any d4 ideas. And now actually, Tau was really ambitious. He played the move e5. And again, there's men who didn't really like this move. It feels like black's asking too much in their little position because he feels like white has the advantage. And I think he's right, because after f takes e5 was played, f takes e5. The point is, black, white goes bishop to b5, attacking black's knight on c6. And all of a sudden, this e5 pawn is under a lot of stress. If black played d4 here, white can play bishop c4 with check. And after king h8, play queen g5. The point is, if d takes c3, white can play rook takes rook, queen takes rook, Queen takes queen, knight takes, and follow in with rook to f8, which is checkmate. So after queen g5 in this variation, black can play bishop e6, but after takes, d takes c3. Again, there's rook takes d8, queen takes, queen takes, rook takes. White has a very nice move, bishop to d7. The point is, if black takes this bishop, then rook f8 is checkmate. So now black has to move the knight away. If knight to a5, White just plays c6 and prepares to promote this pawn to a queen. And if knight to b8, white can be very tricky and play bishop to b5. If h6, white can play c6 and prepare the move c7. If rook c8, you can play c7 anyway as white, attacking the knight. And there's no more squares for this knight to jump into. So if rook takes c7, white can play rook to f8 with check. Uh, for king h7, Rook takes knight, and white's just in a one end game with a whole bishop up. Tal didn't play d4 in this position though, he played bishop to b7 to support his knight. So now what you're thinking, you're thinking, hold on, doesn't white just win this pawn on e5 now? Bishop takes c6, surely, bishop takes knight because now there's no knight defending this pawn. Well actually, black can play an intermezzo move now, d4, attacking the queen and the bishop. And now after this d4 move, black isn't going to lose material. They're going to play queen takes c6 and prefer and mate on g2. For instance, if the white has to play queen to g3, just queen takes c6. And still, this bishop on c3 is under threat. And um, actually, maybe even white's going to lose this c5 pawn. So, white has to be very careful in this position. But, Nesmetnov saw all these ideas. He played queen to g3. Tau played rook to d7 to protect this uh, g7 square. Rook f2 was played, and now actually bishop takes c6 is the threat. With the rook on d7, there's no more d4 ideas after bishop takes c6. Rook e8 is played to defend the pawn, and h3 was played. And here Nesmetnov made an interesting notation in his notes. He said black is in a very peculiar zugzwang and has no single good move. And it's very true, there's literally nothing black can do in this position. Possibly d4 is an option, but then even then, like white just wins with bishop to c4 check, king h8, and rook to f1, threatening mate on f8. If queen c8 to defend, rook f7, preparing queen takes g7 mate. If rook takes, rook takes, rook g8 to defend again, then bishop d2 is a very nice move. The point is, let's say d3. White can play even bishop h6 here, because if g takes h6, taking the bishop, White plays queen f2. French play rook queen f6, which would lead to checkmate. If queen d8 to block this and stop um, queen f6, then there's just bishop takes d3. And again, white's threatening mate with rook takes h7. If rook g7 to stop this, rook f8 with check, rook g8, and then there's even queen f7. Ridiculous. Threatening mate on h7 again. And after queen d4 check, king h1, there's literally nothing that uh, black can do to defend. Either queen g8 will be mate, or queen takes h7. 
So that was an absolutely dirty variation that white could go into if black played d4. Instead, Tau played bishop a8. Just wait and see what white will do. So it's just asking Nesmetnov what have you got here. And Nesmetnov responds with bishop to a4. Just increasing his advantage ever so slightly. Tau goes backwards, bishop b7. And again, Nesmetnov calmly plays king h1. Increases their advantage even more so. Stopping any checks on the dark squares if the variations come to it. Tau goes back. Bishop a8, and now rook to f5 is played by white. And here actually Nesmetnov said that black was under a lot of time pressure. No surprise, because he's in a very defensive position here. And this type of position doesn't suit Tau's style at all. So in the game, Tau played e4. g6 was also maybe an option, but uh, as Nesmetnov said, he would have played bishop takes c6. After queen takes c6, just pick up the pawn on e5. Rook takes, and if rook f8, just play bishop to d4. All of a sudden, white is a pawn up with a very nice game. Um, this d5 pawn really limits the scope of this bishop. And white has a very easy game. So going back, time pressure was enforced on tally. Played the move e4, preparing the trade of queen. So queen takes c7 was played, rook takes c7, and now rook f takes d5. So white just won a free pawn. Tal continued with e3. And Nesmetnov goes in for the kill, rook to d7. Threatened to take the rook on c7, also has ideas of rook takes g7. If rook e7 here for black to try and defend this, then there's a rook takes c7, rook takes c7, and rook to d6. And white's got a very stable position, and they're just going to try and hoover up this pawn with the king. And it should be a one endgame. For instance, if king f8 is king g1, king e8, king f1. Um, and white's just going to pick up another pawn and has the two bishops just dominating this knight. So going back to the game, in the game Tau played e2, ferociously trying to get some counterplay, but it's too little too late. Nesmetnov finishes black off, bishop to b3 with check, rook e6 to block, and then it was just bishop takes e6, again check, king f8, and bishop takes g7, and here Tau resigned the game. I should just go back after bishop to b3. There's not really a lot that uh, black can do in this position because if king h8, there would be bishop takes g7 with checkmate as well. So in the final position after bishop takes g7, here Tal resigned. The point is if king e8, white would play bishop to f7, which is checkmate. And here, another clash of the titans finishes with an Nesmetnov win. I think I saw a video where Agad Mater actually said Nesmetnov beats Tal, but Tal beats everyone else, and this seems pretty much true. It's very surprising that Tal didn't manage to beat Nesmetnov in any games. I guess this was because Tal was always playing black, and never actually had a white game, officially anyway, against Nesmetnov. Now, although they're not in Nesmetnov's greatest games, there's two, there's two other games that they did play, so I'm going to try and search these out and bring them to you in the form of a great video commentary session. So, hopefully, I'll see you in the next videos. If you did enjoy my content, please drop me a like, comment or subscribe to the channel, it really helps. And hopefully I'll see you again soon. Thank you very much.